Now this morning, we're starting, not starting, we're continuing with our series, going through the Gospel of Mark. Now, last week we you know, saw the first nature miracle in the Gospel of Mark, uh, the Jesus calming the storm, fascinating story, and what follows on after that is Jesus meets the, what we call the Gadarene demoniac. The man in the Gerasenes and Jesus casts out demons, a legion of demons out of him, and he sends the demons into the pigs. Straight after that, we see the healing of Jairus' daughter and this most beautiful story of this lady with the issue of blood who comes to Jesus and she just touches the hem of his garment and she is healed. Or a beautiful story. Go and read it. Absolutely fascinating. But I think we've caught the concept that part of Jesus' mission was casting out demons, healing the sick. We've seen nature miracles taking place. He's preaching the word. I think we've started to catch that concept of what his mission is. So we're going to fast forward just ever so slightly to Mark chapter 6. It's a fascinating story that happens in his hometown. So let's all stand together as we read the word of the Lord from Mark chapter 6. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach at the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. Let's close our eyes for a moment and pray. Dear God, as we study your word, this morning I know that your Holy Spirit wants to speak to our hearts. Oh God, if ever, our hearts need to be open. This morning we come to you. Lord, open our hearts, open our eyes, and open our ears. May we hear what the Spirit of God is saying to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's take our seats. Let's take our seats. I'm going to start with a story, and I know I've shared a similar story but a few months ago, but I'm going to share something similar. My wife was a very powerful sportswoman in her youth, and still, in fact, even today. Um, if, any, if there is a racket in her hand or a stick in her hand, incredible what she's capable of. Now, often she would give my daughters advice when it comes to their sports. When you hold the tennis racket, hold it this way. When you hit the hockey ball, make sure your feet are in this position, your stick is in that position, and you would think because they know that she was in fact a pretty decent sportswoman, that they would say, yes, I'm going to listen. I'm going to apply these things. But what we have found that parenting can be quite difficult at times. How many of you are blessed by your children and at other times you think to yourself, listen for heaven's sake. Anybody here? And so you would think that they're going to apply what Binks had told them, but it turns out they do exactly the opposite. Any ever happened to you? Until, until a knight in shining armor arrives, a genius among men. They call him the coach. This man knows everything. A legend, no less. And eventually he comes to the girls and tells them exactly the same thing 
that their mother had told them and they come home and they say, oh, mom, the coach helped me with the way that I hit the hockey ball. Oh, it was wonderful. And everything inside of you just wants to say, but we said exactly the same thing to you. And often then I ask myself, why would you take the advice from a perfect stranger and not the advice that your mother gave you? Now there's an old English saying that says familiarity breeds contempt. How many of you ever heard that? Familiarity breeds contempt. When we're in close proximity with a person, it's a good thing it breeds a familiar connection with that person, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. We want to have deep relationships. We want to get to know people. We want to have deep conversations. We want people also at times to see our difficulties and our frailties and our weaknesses and all those types of things. That's important in our lives, especially in a family context. But where it becomes toxic is when we allow that familiarity with a person that we no longer take input from that person because we no longer appreciate the gift that they are in our lives. And what happens is we close our hearts off to receive from those people. We start to close our hearts off. Now that can happen in many different relationships, but it's usually where there is a type of leader-follower experience. It might be parent and child. It might be you and a teacher. It might be you and your pastor. I hope it's not, but that can happen. You and your boss. You and the leader of the team. That because of that familiarity with that person, if you don't heed and you still respect the office and the position, what happens is that familiarity breeds contempt and it closes your heart to receive from that person. But when it comes to the things of God, one of the worst things that can happen to a believer is when our proximity to God and His things, which should take us deeper into His presence, which should make our hearts open wide, we need to watch out that that proximity does not lead to a toxic familiarity where we start to lose a sense of awe and wonder of who God is. The moment we start to lose a sense of awe and wonder of who God is, our hearts are closed. We no longer receive that which God has in store for us. What starts to happen is that church starts to become a chore. Something that I just tick off. And my prayer for us here this morning is that us as a church, as believers, will make sure that we never lose that sense of awe and wonder of the greatness of who He is so that we can always hold on tight to Him. Hold on tight and never become familiar in a toxic way with the Lord. Now tell me if you've ever heard this statement. If I could just see Jesus and I could see Jesus perform a miracle, then I'll believe. How many have ever heard that statement? If I've got a 10 rand note for every single time that I heard that statement, I'll be able to fill up my entire car with petrol. And maybe you have made that statement in the past before. Maybe you've made that statement. Maybe you've said, you know what? If only I could see Jesus, then I will believe. But until that time, I'm going to be skeptical. Maybe that's you. I want to remind you about something. In our text this morning, in our text this morning, these people saw Jesus in the flesh they heard his teaching. They even saw him heal people from their diseases. And they still rejected him. And they still closed their hearts to him. And they saw him in the flesh. It was all down to the atmosphere in their own hearts. That's what it came down to. 
And so even this morning, let's not fool ourselves to think if only I was there. People that saw him in the flesh also rejected them on the basis of a heart that was closed to the things of God. So let's look at this text a little bit further. He went away from there, and he came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. If we can just put the scripture on there. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? Now you would think, after all the miraculous things that Jesus has done in the surrounding countryside and in all the different towns, that these people would be excited to see Jesus coming home. He's going to get a hometown welcome with a ticker tape parade. How many of you would expect that? He is one of our own. He's made his way in the world. Not only that, he's put Nazareth on the map. He's Jesus of Nazareth. Here he comes. Let's, let's throw a party for this man. But we find exactly the opposite happening. A real case of tall poppy syndrome where one person rises above and then the society wants to cut the person down. And so what we see here is these people, the people of Nazareth, they've watched him grow up. They are so familiar with Jesus and his family and who he is that they actually end up failing to see that he is in fact divine. It says that they were astonished at his teaching. Astonished. Now you would think that's quite a positive thing. They were astonished at his teaching. But it's actually in a bit of a negative term. They were astonished, not like, wow, look at this. They were astonished in negative terms saying, he doesn't even have any schooling. He's got no education. Where did this guy get all of these sayings and this wisdom? And how was he able to do all these works with his hands? And in fact, there's a question that they are asking. Either Jesus and his works are from God, or they are from the devil, or he is a liar and a charlatan. We're going to reject them. And it's very clear when we look at the text, they rejected the first part of it. They rejected the fact that he was from God. They rejected the fact that his teaching is from God. They rejected that. So they probably thought this man is either a magician, a liar, a charlatan, or maybe worse, he's in cahoots with the devil himself. But then they start to mock him even further. They then turn to him and say, isn't this the carpenter? A man just like us that works with his hands. How can he now come and do teaching among us? He's of lowly standing. Not only that, they say, isn't this the son of Mary? Now that was derogatory. The reason why is in the Jewish culture, he always mentioned a person by the father's name. This is Jesus, son of Joseph. And the reason they say Jesus, son of Mary, is because there were questions about his legitimacy, the fact that, you know, Joseph wasn't his father, maybe there was another father, we don't know. So they kind of put a slight on his character, they put a slight on his family. Then they go even further and they mention all the the brothers' names. They're basically saying, these guys aren't special, we know them. Therefore, this guy is not special. Why on earth should we listen to him? Why should we listen to him? But now what's fascinating is how they're going to respond to Jesus and how Jesus is going to respond to them. Now let's take it a bit further. And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there 
except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and he healed them and he marveled because of their unbelief. Now the response of the people and the response of Jesus to them leads us to our big idea this morning. Now my big idea is actually one thought and we're going to express it in two different ways. One positive and one negative. And this is your take home for today. An awestruck, receptive heart allows the Lord to access, access to transform your life. Unhealthy familiarity with God leads to a resistant, hardened heart which misses out on God's power. Which one would you like to be today? A person with an awestruck heart, open, humble, that allows the Lord to transform your life? Or are you going to allow unhealthy familiarity with God that leads to a resistant heart and that you end up missing out on God's power exactly the same way that the people of Nazareth missed out on the power of God? Now, our text says that the people were offended with Jesus. Offended with him. Offended with what? With the messenger that gives the message They were offended with him. He's such a lowly person. And Jesus responds with an aphorism or a proverb. And he says, a prophet is not honored in his hometown, in his own country. Because of what? Because of familiarity that breeds content. How many of you have ever found, those of you who are Christians that have have lived the Christian life for a long time, the hardest people sometimes to reach will be your own family. Anybody here? Tough. Why? Because they knows you. They know what you've done in the past. (laughs) They know all of your flaws. So it's very hard sometimes. So familiarity breeds contempt. And here Jesus is not honored in his hometown. Obviously the big difference is he was perfect. Okay? He had no sin. But the people of Nazareth with their proud hearts, resistant, they end up missing out on the blessing of Jesus. In fact, when we look at it, the whole nation of Israel, most of them would reject Christ, and it would be the Gentiles that would receive Christ en masse. His own people would reject, and the Gentiles would receive him. The people of Nazareth rejected but you find the people in surrounding countryside ran towards him. Fascinating, isn't it? Fascinating. We see that Jesus could not do a mighty work in his own hometown. Now, Mark's emphasis is not quite on the fact that Jesus couldn't do a mighty work. Remember, he's God. He can do a mighty work if he wants to do one. However, Jesus didn't feel free to do any mighty works there because of the atmosphere of a lack of faith and unbelief in the town itself. And he felt that this is not a place that I'm going to be doing any type of miraculous work at all. Because where there are receptive hearts, awestruck hearts, people filled with faith, people filled with anticipation, you find that people's hearts are open to receive. That is the type of atmosphere that attracts the work of God. But here in Nazareth, it's exactly the opposite, and they end up missing out, except for a few people that come to the front because they want to be healed maybe just because of the desperation of the illness, the only people that saw Jesus do any type of miraculous work were the people that were desperate enough to go. As for the rest, the majority of the people in Nazareth, they missed out completely on what God wanted to do. But what is fascinating is the wording that Jesus uses. It says that Jesus marveled at them. He marveled at them. Usually it's the people that marvel about Jesus, about what he's doing. The people marveled. They were astonished. Look at what Jesus is doing. That's incredible. There are only two places in the Bible that Jesus marvels. 
and this is one of them. When I close today, I'll share with you the other part, the other time when Jesus marvels. But imagine you were the people recorded in Scripture for the rest of history, that you were the people that Jesus marveled at, not because of your faith. He marveled at you because of your unbelief. And here, 2,000 years later, we read the passage of how Jesus marveled at the people of Nazareth and their unbelief. Now, often with these types of messages, we often think of people that are not Christians. We think of a secular people, atheists, all these people that are unbelievers. This, this message is for them. And yes, for sure, there is in some way an element that we are looking at that as well. I remember seeing this quote from the atheistic philosopher Thomas Nagel from New York University. Um, this is what he said. Um, I'm going to put it up on the screen there. Yeah. I want atheism to be true and am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God, and naturally, I hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope that there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. Now, why did Thomas Nagel say that? In essence, if there is a God, that means that there will be commandments that I need to follow, and I don't want to. I want to live my own life, and I do not want to be accountable to anybody else. And because of that, his heart is closed. He says, not only do I not believe in God, I don't want there to be a God, and he ends up missing out on the life-giving power of Jesus Christ that fills our souls, forgives our sins, and gives us eternal life. And if you're an unbeliever here today, I do want to say this, maybe even as I'm preaching, there's a warmth in your heart and God is speaking to you. I want to tell you, Christ is real. Jesus died on that cross. He was raised from the dead, and he offers eternal life to you and the forgiveness of sins. Receive him today. It's the greatest thing that you can do. But I think for the majority of us here, how many of you count yourself as believers here? Hands up quickly. Okay. This message today is for you and me. How do we make sure that our hearts are always open to receive? In a metaphorical sense, the church is Jesus' hometown. We are the people of God. We are his people. This is his house. The church is the place where Christians are, are gathered together as the church and we worship together. We read God's word together. The promises are for us, and they are yes and amen. We even have the privilege of experiencing the presence of God in our lives. What a privilege is that not for us as believers? But if we don't heed and we don't take care, that proximity that we have, if we don't keep pressing into God and have humble hearts to receive from Him, it can very quickly start to switch into a toxic familiarity where we become familiar with God and the things of God. Now, let me explain what that looks like. Okay? Instead of an open heart, there's a critical spirit that starts to come in. Instead of a passion for God, there is an element of going through the motions. It's a tick box. You know, I guess it's the right thing to do for us to go to church. I guess it's probably healthy for us to be part of a community. So it's probably the right thing to do, so let's just keep on going. It's good for my CV. I'm part of a church community. I remember someone once said they wanted to come and do like, like stuff so that they can put it on their CV. I was like, oh, okay, great. Um, now, what does Jesus say 
about that. Jesus makes a statement where he says, speaking about uh, the people of Israel, he says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. When I start to become familiar in a bad way with the God and the things of God, what starts to happen is I start to worship God with my lips, but no longer with my heart. I no longer receive, I'm no longer open for the word of God to impact my life. I no longer listen intently, is this for me? God, what are you saying to me? How about this? Not the gospel of Mark again. Can't you preach on something more exciting, surf? I've heard that one. I've read Mark. I've heard that one. Can we do a nicer topic? Like how I'm going to drive out of church with my new Ferrari. Can we preach on something a little bit more exciting than the gospel of Mark? I've read that one. I've sung that song before. Can't we get some new songs, man? Oh, I don't like the new songs. Can't we sing the old songs? Music's too loud. When is Surf's voice going to get better? Because it's starting to irritate me. Oh, this is a great sermon for Uncle Johnny. I really hope that he's listening to this one. We start to project on other people when it's supposed to be for us. Notice that proximity, that familiarity when we start to come and sit in a church service like this and instead of focusing on that which God is saying to me, that critical spirit starts to come in and we start to miss out on what God has in store for us. You start to lose a sense of awe and wonder of who he is. What we are doing right now is incredibly Incredibly sacred. Not that there is a divide between the sacred and the secular. I appreciate that. Everything is sacred. But when we get together as the church in a biblical way, this is incredibly sacred. It's never become familiar with these things. And as a church... You often find that in sermons, and I've seen this often, and I know I've shared this before, you preach a sermon, and two people hear the same message. One walks out with their life completely transformed. They are never the same ever again. And somebody else hears exactly the same message, and they walk out cold. No change. Was it the preacher's fault? The word's fault, the Holy Spirit's fault, the fan's fault, the heat's fault. Or does it have something to do with the nature of the heart, whether it is receptive or whether it is closed? Whether it receives gladly or whether it rejects that which comes close? Who shall we be? Who shall we be? Dare I say there are times when Jesus marvels at our unbelief. And I hope that we're going to be a church where Jesus marvels at our faith. Where he says, those people from Junction Church, man, I just drop one, I just pitch up in one moment and these people just drink it in. They cannot wait. They're just desperate for more of me. I'm going to bless them with more of me because there is faith in that house. May we be that church. I'm going to close with this. I'm going to ask the band to join me as well. I'm going to close with the only other time where Jesus marveled. And we find it in Luke's gospel in chapter 7. It's the story of this Roman centurion who has a servant who is sick. And he calls on Jesus. Now remember, this is not a Jew. This is a Gentile Roman centurion that has got nothing to do with the promises of Israel. And he calls out onto Jesus. So let's, let's catch up the story in verse 6. And Jesus went with him 
And when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you. Can you notice the humility in this man? Can you notice the reverence in this man? He's not some random rural dweller there in Nazareth where the people compare themselves as on the same level of Jesus. This is an important man, a wealthy man, a man of stature and position. But in in a metaphorical sense, he's bending the knee in humility, saying, I'm not even worthy. I know that you're a Jew. I know that I'm a Gentile. I know that you should not be hanging out with Gentiles. I know who you are, and you probably know who I am. I'm not worthy to even be in your presence. Can you notice how reverent this man is? Then he continues, and it says, but say the word, and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does that. Notice the great faith of the man, and how receptive his heart is, and not only that, how he's anticipating, he's anticipating that Jesus is going to do something miraculous. Powerful thought. A powerful thought. Then it closes like this in verse 9. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Two places in scripture where Jesus marvels. The people of Nazareth, he marvels at their unbelief. (laughs) And at a Gentile Roman centurion, he marvels at his great faith. Who will you be? Who will we be? And may we be a church that has got a faith that anticipates the great things that God's going to do. A church that is full of reverence and awe of who God is. Let's trust that we'll be that church because that is where God moves in mighty ways.